right, so we'll continue our discussion on silicon processing, semiconductor material processing. So basically the idea is how do we start with a bare silicon wafer or for that matter, any semiconductor wafer and what are the processes that we do? How does it go from just a, a plain, pure crystalline silicon a, up to a transistor or a workable device or an integrated circuit? So we start with design of a mask. So mask is something that CAD people would do. So that's where they would know what kind of uh, material we are using. So they know a lot of about, about the uh, limitations of the current technology, fabrication technology. So keeping that in mind, they would design the masks the mask set. Basically, it would be a bunch of masks. Different masks will come at different stages of fabrication. So we, in, in this, it's just showing us as a loop, we have wafer and from wafer we go to fill, we make a film, that film can be an oxide layer. It can be just photoresist because we are going to do processing with that. So we create that film and then it go into lithography. We photoresist is a coating of a polymer, very thin coating, just like nail polish for, to understand it in, a, in common terms. So that film photoresist, we transfer the pattern by doing a process called lithography. Optical lithography is where we use UV light source. We use optical light. But then there are other forms, and we will look at some of those. This lithography will result in, into the formation of pattern. Then maybe there is an etching that we have location, and then we have to remove oxide so we can get to silicon beneath. That stage, we may be doing doping, we may be depositing metal, we may be etching silicon. So whatever is the case, it would go and we will get the wafer, but then it may have to go again into another cycle. It would go on through this cycle until all the masks have been uh, used and all the different layers of fabrication steps have been taken care of. And then we have a, a finished wafer, which will be cut into diced into smaller pieces, that step is called dicing, and packaged into IC and sent on. Now, lithography is the process which we have looked at some basic ideas. So we'll, to continue on that discussion, the light source that we use, that has important implications of a number of things. It has an implication on resolution, so resolution here is a very scientific term. Resolution is that, that size that we can resolve, size that we can transfer within specific tolerances. There is limit to that, how small can we do or how sharp an image can we make? And that has to do with the thing called Rayleigh criterion. Rayleigh criterion is a, is a physics experiment of, of where we, the experiment is that we throw a light on two very sh small openings in a uh, in an opaque screen, and if two rays go through and they strike on another screen, those two rays will be acting as waves, and there is constructive and destructive interference. And on the screen at the end, it is important that we should be able to resolve. We should be able to identify two waves separate. So it's, it's a physics, it's trying to just take the idea that there's a limit to how many uh, signals or the wave that's coming through, the light that's coming through, how much of that can we be able to resolve? So this picture is showing that concept here. The idea is that we, we have a light source and then we have the mask. Now, mask ha has the features, like these blocks are shown. Let me change color of the... So these, these are features of the mask. 
Now light travels through and the light should be able to be focused and should be able to, now this is showing one, two rays coming together, but there are multiple rays, so they should be able to transfer the image clearly. If they're not, then we, that's, that's what we would call this, uh, we reach the limit of resolution. We cannot go below that wavelength or we cannot, we are not able to put that pattern. Just wait with me next slide and we'll see why and how is that important and what comes into play of not being able to see one pattern from other patterns. Another issue here is depth of focus. Depth of focus is the idea that if we take a picture, we something is in focus, but other things are out of focus. So what can we do to have everything in focus? That becomes an issue as well. Pitch limit has to do with how close can we make two features next to each other? Now, we will look at UV, deep UV and extreme UV and see their wavelengths relation with these resolution limit parameters. So the first one is resolution limit, right? So how can we resolve two features? So the formula here is W min. So W min is minimal resolvable feature. That if a mask has say two squares and when you project that on the wafer, can you identify those two squares separate from each other or they become condensed and combined into each other? So for that, the relationship is K1 lambda or NA. So these are, these are specific things. K1 is a, is a constant, depends on the lithography type that we're using. Lambda is the wavelength and numerical aperture is another feature of the lens itself. And numerical aperture is again, a constant for one type of system that we are using. So in this relationship, the only thing that can be adjusted is, is lambda, let me go back. The only thing we can adjust here or change or we have control over is, is lambda. K1 is constant for, for photoresist, its value is 0 0.75. Numerical aperture is calculated by N sine alpha, which if you remember from high school physics, optics, we had this thing where we had index of medium acceptance angle. So we can, we can calculate numerical aperture. So numerical aperture is also a constant for a given system. The only thing we can change is lambda. Lambda is the light source. So from this relationship, we see that to get a smaller feature size, we have to make wavelength smaller or we can increase numerical aperture. So there are two things that can be done to make a smaller feature. So to get a smaller feature, W min, either we reduce alpha or reduce lambda, which is wavelengths, or we can increase numerical aperture. This one is, depends on the medium that's there, air or vacuum. So there's not much we can do about that, but we can do something about lambda, right? So here, just remember this for now that by bringing wavelengths down, we can make the the feature, smaller feature on our wafer, All right? Now looking at the second factor, which is depth of focus, that has dependence on, again, on lambda and square root of, uh, sorry, square of numerical aperture. So if I write it down, depth of focus is dependent on, again, lambda, a constant, for the lithography system and numerical aperture. Now, a little bit about depth of focus. We have discussed this idea, why is it relevant here? So on a chip, we have seen that there may be multiple masks involved. So when I go from, maybe I'm at third mask or fourth mask, I already have made a bunch of features on my wafer. There are different heights of those features. 
Now, when I have to make another feature, I want to make sure the light that projects goes through the bass. And there are at different height levels on the wafer. All levels should be in focus. It's same idea like that photography. Some people do photography and they adjust the lens. They want to, to make a very nice picture. They focus on maybe a flower and they do some trick that everything is kind of out of focus, looks nice. So that's very small depth of focus, which means the rays of light are only focused on that level where the flower is. But here, what we want is we want to have a bigger depth of focus. So the different levels of features of device components that we have made already, we should be able to transfer an image on different levels on the height. So thinking about the lenses, lens and the wafer are at, at a, some specific distance. So, and now on the wafer level, there are some ups and downs, which means the feature we want to transfer or the image we want to transfer is not actually the distance of the wafer and the, and the lens, but that distance is some plus and some minus up and down. So here depth of focus becomes important. Now again, here we want depth of focus to be a larger number, not a smaller number. Now, if we have to do that, then we need to increase our lambda. If we have to increase our lambda, but that's going against the idea of that we wanted to reduce lambda to have a smaller feature size. But now we see, we need to have a bigger lambda. So there is a now kind of pushing it two ways. We go down in lambda, we can make smaller feature, but to have a focus on different focal lengths, we need to have higher lambda. So for example, here's a uh, lambda for 248 wavelengths given. So this is the wavelength of a, of a specific UV light. So when you plug in into the equations, we get W main 270, which means the smallest feature I can make is 270 nanometer. But then I'm very restricted in how much up and down my features can be. This right hand cartoon is just showing that when the light rays converge, I want different light rays, different features that are coming need to be all in focus within certain tolerable limit. Like for example, this one that I'm showing, uh, I, this one will not work for us because this is focusing way below photoresist. This is focusing between like below the photoresist, which means the, the image that will be forming will be out of focus, diffused image, right? Just like, when you are focusing your lens, people go out of focus, people come in focus. When they're in focus, that's when you get the perfect image. But if they're awkward, out of focus, the edges of the edges of people or edges of a flower, if you're taking a picture, they will be blurry. We don't want that. Blurry would mean the energy will not get transferred or, and photoresist will not undergo chemical changes that we want for this process. Are you with me so far? All right, I don't see too many videos. Ladies and gentlemen, at least turn your videos on so I can get some visual feedback. All right, so far with me on this? All right, Ali has a mask on today. All right, does it make sense, these two concepts? And now for depth of focus, and even for W main, lots of data has been collected. Many people have published lots of things about it. So this is an example of how depth of focus would change for different numerical approaches. So in this plot, and it's an old picture from 1991. So lithography is an old trade. And we need to know so we can understand how we can do better on these things. If you look at this picture, this graph, there are a couple of things that you need to know. 
here is the pattern size. Again, minimum resolvable feature that we want to make. And here is the refocusing level, which is depth of focus. For different numerical approaches, we see that different feature size. And for any numerical aperture, for that feature size, we have a specific depth of focus. For example, if I want to make a feature, say here, it should be how much? I don't know, 0 0.38 nanometer. Sorry, 0 0.38 micrometer, which is 380 nanometer. For this case, I only have depth of focus between probably 0.5 to 0.6 micrometer. So which means that by trying to making things smaller, I cannot have different levels on that wafer. So it restricts me in my mask design. So do you understand the, the problem here? Now this, if you use another numerical aperture, if you use another system or use, so for numerical aperture, you can change the index of medium. So medium, which would have a different, uh, what was that? Let me go back. The relationship, N sine alpha. So that would have a different index. So that's how you can achieve different numerical aperture. Now, I can choose and play with whatever works for my uh, minimum feature that I want to make. But it's not easy because numerical aperture is a, is a function of the whole uh, lithography system. You cannot easily change that. But just to give an idea that these are kind of trade-offs -off, trade in there. But there was another thing which was pitch limit, which is how close can we make one feature from another feature? So when you do the lithography, the boundaries of features, they, if, they make, if you make them too close, the photoresist will get exposed in between. So you will lose resolution. So two features will get emerged and, and what you will get on the wafer will be one feature. We, we don't want that. So then again, we want to know how close can we pack them. Can somebody guess why is it important to pack them very close to each other? So we want to make things small that everybody understands, right? We want, we have multiple mass sets. Okay, that makes sense. We need to have bigger depth of focus. Why we want to make them close to each other? Sir, to decrease the size, sir. That was number one, right? That was W bin. Why we want to make them close to each other? Yes. Why do you want to make them close to each other? To save space. To save space. Why do yes, exactly you're on the right track. Why do you want to save space? Uh, sir, to decrease the res resistivity, sir. Resistivity. We haven't talked about resistivity. We're just talking about real estate and how many can we pack them there. Why do you want to bring make them close to each other to save space? That's very interesting. That's an important step. Why do you want to save space, Aruma? Um, so we can pack billions of them together. So we can have many, many, many more in there. So it's like more economical as well. Like, we do uh, what? Save to save our material. Or save, maybe like, exactly, save yeah. material. And we like, think about if you have 100 square yard, we want to park 10 cars or we want to park 20 cars. I don't know, car 100 square yard. So if you want to park many more cars, you have to park them next close to each other. Now you want to pack many, many, many more transistors in same one or 1.5 square centimeter. So one thing is you make them smaller. The other thing is we make them close to each other. So we cram many more of them. But if there is a limitation of how many we can cram, and that comes here with this relationship, that this, uh, I don't know, what is this called? Is this sigma or what? So it has pitch limit is equal to lambda over two N, N, A. So small n is again a factor of the system. Capital numerical aperture is 
function of system the lambda is the wavelength so if i make lambda small i can cram many more devices on the same uh, square area that i could do with the bigger wavelength so if i do uh, say i'm just giving a number if i do uh, 436 nanometer wavelengths that will give me a number of uh, pitch which would be the distance so now i have to make my devices away from each other but if i do 365 nanometer wavelength which means i can make my devices closer so in suppose 1 cm by 1 cm now i can instead of i don't know say if i had 100 devices now i can put 120 devices there this makes sense which means more power which means more throughput which means what we call 300 the 3 gigahertz 3 gigahertz microprocessor or 5 gigahertz microprocessor so if i have more of them i can process more yeah the one said no you gave the right answer no one said so we can have more features on a single wafer exactly more components on a single wafer or more precisely on one die so again lambda has this effect also that I, if i make smaller the lambda i can put many more of those things together so what are the wavelengths they have used so starting from 1975 there was 405 nanometer wavelength exposure at numerical aperture of 0.32 it was mercury lamp so we have over years tried to bring the wavelength down there was other technology change also like step and repeat where the camera would or a uv exposure would happen one place on the same wafer then move to another place expose it move on expose it move on that's called step and repeat so now instead of using wavelength they started calling them by by name g line lithography or i line lithography which was essentially another way of saying 436 nanometer or 365 nanometer and then we kept on pushing up to what is called deep uv deep uv is 248 nanometer 193 nanometer extreme uv 30 nanometer below now below extreme uv we get into x rays everybody knows x rays right what do x rays do what is the single most important property of x rays when we stand in front of the x ray machine what do what do x rays do They just go through, interact just, with biomolecules of the body. They just go through us. No, dude, they don't. Yeah, they, if you have longer exposure, high exposure, but X-rays just go through us, right? So we have played at the back. X-rays pass through tissue. X-rays have very high energy. When you say they they interact with our molecules, yes, you're right. They are very energetic waves. So. now the problem there becomes that we are using for lens we use glass that's the optical lithography so they start meshing with glass now for all these wavelengths we can just plug in the numbers and find out minimum resolution we can find out depth of focus we can find out depth of uh, sorry the the pitch how close can be or what should be the minimum distance between devices so we can get them transferred to the wafer so so but these things then refine our resolution limits for example if i keep on going shorter wavelengths we make smaller sizes but we have problems with the lens itself because those waves carry too high energy and an energy we can calculate from hc over lambda i told you before this relationship whenever we have a wave we have lambda we can easily straight away find out the energy they carry now if i plug in numbers for these things for 248 or 193 so i can easily find out the energy that's related to that now few things about deep uv and and uh, and below extreme uv and below they require very 
special light sources. Before that, we had mercury source, so we could change the element in those lamps, and we could get the wavelengths that we were talking about, four, uh, 365 and G-line and I-line. But now it becomes a problem because we are getting into lasers. We are getting into very, uh, what do you call it? specialized light sources that adds to adds to the cost, adds to the interest, and adds to the, the whole system needs to be made special for them. Now, with these lambdas, by plugging the values, we can find out minimum feature size from that W min formula, right? So straight away with argon fluoride, we can make 70 nanometer ARF. But the problem is that they have very, very high energy and their energy is almost, we can calculate it, that energy. Their energy, for example, for argon fluoride, they, they have energy of 6.42 electron volt from HC over lambda. And quartz, quartz is silicon dioxide or quartz is that glass we are using for lenses. That has band gap energy of eight electron volt. So it's getting almost to the energy of those materials that are used. That means it would start messing up their atomic structure. So that's one of the biggest problem which is written here is what we call silica densification. When glass becomes dense, it stops transmitting the light through. When the light can't go through, so which means the light we are projecting will not get through will not, the, all the energy will not reach to your wafer, your photoresist will not get exposed, right? So these issues become so much important that we cannot use silica. We cannot use glass uh, optics or we cannot even use transmittable optics. So we have to do some other tricks. We may, and, and they have issues with the absorption in, silica or even in air as well. So we have to then use specialized optics, reflective or refractive optics. So now reflective, we know like a mirror, they would turn and we can adjust the mirror angles and we can focus them. Refractive is where they go from one medium to other. And when a ray goes from one medium to another medium, it goes through some angle change depending on the difference in the refractive index. So those can be used to control the direction of rays. So we can focus where you want to go. But that's, again, these are expensive. So on the optical lithography, we have reached the limitation of 100 and, uh, 150 to 200 nanometer, about 25 to 25 years ago. So. To recap, we have to see that these are the three competitive problems there. Minimum feature size, depth of focus, and pitch. How often can we make those small devices and how can we take care of different mass sets? Right? Questions? Sorry, I have the please, annotation left for the question. So when I say we reach the limit of 150, that was that's optical lithography. We haven't talked about any tricks. We haven't talked about any, uh, what are the modern things that have been done, right? So that's what we call next generation lithography, or we'll look at those in later chapters or later lectures. All right, questions. Now going back to the, the again, the figures that I shared at the start, we have transferred the pattern. We do a bunch of things, right? We do, we deposit material, we dope. Now before doping, we have to etch to make a window, right? We saw that before. The etching is a process, iron implantation is a process. So let's look at etching because when we make our feature, we have to remove silicon dioxide, for example. Like we, we saw that we can put a mask and we can shine light, and then we have to get rid of silicon dioxide first. So silicon dioxide is removed by etching. And etching is a 
simple process of reacting some chemicals so we remove some material right give me example of an etching process an example of an etching process can you think of an etching process have you made a pcb before anybody yes, has sir. a printed circuit board such uh, remove the layer from surface of paper sir we use etching sir removing what uh, removing sir uh, chemical chemical sir right right from where sir microfabrication surface from surface of wafer sir from surface of wafer copper removal from pcb i was just looking for an example how to where do we have you seen etching process every day like do you know etching where do where do we use etching have you made printed circuit board and if you have made a printed circuit board before pcb you yes, make a design yes. and it has copper on it we transfer the design and then we dip it into a chemical acid and it removes that copper from places and leaves behind lines that you want to use to make your uh, to solder your components that's called a pcb we do etching in there and as amad is saying uh, we we can use a chemical to remove some material from other surfaces it can be it's not etching but it can be you can think of uh, yeah that's not like nail polish remover that doesn't remove nail with it but it removes photo resist or that chemical coating that we have done that would not be considered as etching if uh, any of you if you have seen the battery electrodes you know the car battery electrode when it goes bad if you look at it the metal is is coming off it's basically reacted with the uh, acid for too long and the metal itself starts coming off so that's a reaction so etching is a chemical reaction to remove some material but here there is a word that goes with that the, the word is selective removal of material what does selective removal of material means in a in a big world we we take select or selected to be somebody who is preferred over others right or something that we can say in choices we select have selective treatment with somebody than other so here what we are doing is we we are saying that if i have uh, silicon and silicon dioxide on, on my wafer i want to dip it into a solution that would etch Well, maybe one material and not the other. So I can say I want something that etches only silicon dioxide and does not etch silicon. That would be selective removal. This the chemical would react only with silicon dioxide and not with silicon. And I told you before we we use buffered hydrofluoric acid for that BHF. Right. So BHF is etchant for SiO two. and it it's it doesn't etch as side right everybody agrees with me there now when we use photoresist on our devices and we transfer pattern in photoresist we want to use a chemical that would not etch photoresist and etch whatever window when we have open window whatever material is below generally silicon dioxide now bhf does not etch photoresist also so think about it buffered hydrofluoric acid would be etching a hard solid material like silicon dioxide but it will not be etching photoresist which is a polymer a thin polymer layer that we have deposited that's the import that's the importance of etching why we are looking at it and why we are talking about it now the two types of etching wet etching and dry etching that's uh, written here now the basic difference is that it depends on our design of our whatever 
we are doing and how much material we want to edge and how selectivity how much selectivity we we can achieve it's not always straightforward the, that we have silicon and silicon dioxide there may be copper there may be tungsten there may be so many other materials that are on your chip that we want to have maybe dry etching or wet etching depending on whatever the situation is and whatever recipe do we have i'm using the word recipe here like before so recipe is something we look at that different combination of gases their temperatures their uh, flow rate and then we know if you get this mixture then what kind of selectivity would we would get there's uh, another important thing here which is called an isotropic or isotropic so isotropic and an isotropic is on top of selectivity it is another feature that the etchant may have higher etch rate in one plane of semiconducting material remember we talked about diamond structure for silicon and there i said there are different planes 100111 so an etchant may have higher etch rate against one plane because there are probably more atoms available there than etching less in another plane and then we can control the rate of etch by many things like we can change the concentration of the etchant we can dilute it that would slow it down we can make it hot so the etch rate can go up or we can have kind of a way that when there is etching happening we keep on removing the product so more etchant can attack whatever we want to etch or in dry etching we use plasma and plasma is ionized gas that's what plasma is called in in dry etching we can have very high aspect ratio and i'll i'll show you what does that mean to have high aspect ratio now just to look at isotropic and and an isotropic so isotropic would be kind of etch that goes in all directions same way so the example is that if i make an etch window in silicon dioxide for example or or here when i say mask i'm talking about the masking material which is silicon dioxide generally on silica the left hand picture shows that the etch is going in all directions equally but the right hand is showing that it is etching more vertically than horizontally so what it gives us it gives me a very deep straight trench and we need that for making pressure sensors or accelerometers that i showed you in one lecture before we look at some examples today also so and why does it happen there are multiple there can be multiple reasons how we make it happen like this or it has its own chemical propensity to etch one side more than the other side we can make it by maybe we put some charge so if you are talking about ionized gases we are talking about plasma you can put some electrodes and make the plasma uh, these are ion right these are atoms which are charged we can make them travel much faster vertically by applying voltage across the whole chamber so that would mean they would be traveling much 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 more in the vertical direction than horizontal and they will etch vertically instead of horizontally so that's one way but there's the chemical may be have it can have more etch rate in one plane than the other plane and that's also called an isotropic so when we define selectivity it's its level of affection you can call it but it's reactivity level of reactivity of a recipe or a chemical to one material than the other material more reactivity with one than the other now it, it can be again it can be between like for bhf between silicon or silicon dioxide or between photo resistant silicon dioxide right so there are we have to compare different materials on whatever situation we have on our wafer and then define selectivity in that sense now when you have a material that you put as a mask like silicon dioxide so that selectivity is important there as well 
Another important for important thing for etch is that when we do etching on one wafer, it has to it should do exactly the same thing on the next wafer. We cannot have chip to chip or wafer to wafer variation. That would mess up the whole fabrication process. Cost, some chemicals are very expensive. Like you'll see a, a recipe for gold, aqua regia. It's a, it's a very expensive chemical. It's a mixture of chemicals. So we want to look for something that's cheaper. Some etch and can etch much, much faster. We don't want them to etch too fast because maybe we are etching very thin layer. We don't want it to go fast so we can control it. It can be our problem with we want to etch in one direction and not the other, which is the degree of an isotropy. What kind of material it leaves behind after etch is done? So here I'm showing one picture I took many years ago, which is showing left over. Like after the etching is done, you see this part is, is all rough. So after etching, it left a very very non-uniform surface. And I need the surface roughness to be within maybe 100 nanometer. But here, what it left behind was few microns kind of roughness. So as a device engineer, that may be something not acceptable. So here, this is an interesting picture. There are three levels of things are shown. This is silicon. This is silicon dioxide. And then again, this is silicon. So the etchant has etched silicon. It did not touch silicon dioxide at all. It did cut it on the edges, but that was because it was cutting below silicon and the things were getting flaked off, were broken because there was no support below. But silicon here at the top also you can see is similar kind of rough surface like here. So that's an example of a an example of selectivity that the same edge would do one side and not the other side. This picture is another interesting example. This is a hole, not a hole, a squarish hole. So this is basically, it has etched it in this way that you have a bigger, window at the top, but as it went down, the smaller window is at the bottom, which means it had higher edge weight vertically and very lower edge weight on the sides. So it, the window became like a trench. Are you with me so far? Going too fast? I haven't got any questions for Imran today, so. Emma, you with us? Yeah, sure. All right. So, just a couple of examples and then we'll stop here for today. So, now going back to this example that I've showed you before, we put photoresist, do the mass, do the exposure, we do the, uh, we remove photoresist, and what we are left with. Okay, we, before we remove photosis, we have to transfer the pattern. So we transfer the pattern in silicon dioxide by doing a BHF dip, buffered hydrofluoric acid. So it's going to remove silicon dioxide. So that's the etching step that happened. And then we remove photosis. Now this can be used to do further processing. Like in this case, we are using doping, we are using ions. And this example again, like we saw before, and now you can get some idea of MEMS fabrication as well. So we talked about, we open a window and then we etch through that. So red would be silicon dioxide and yellow would be silicon. We can make a window and we can do a deep etch. Now this is example of an azotropic etch where, or it's called high aspect ratio etch where we have gone deeper more than going to the sides. Or we can make a big window, put some material that is uh, selected between yellow and green and etch it from the backside. When you do that, you're left with a, a thin membrane which is suspended on and connected from all sides, but it's a very thin area. Can be used to make uh, 
those accelerometers type of things. So this now deep thing is called high aspect ratio, HAR. High aspect ratio is something we would use it, uh, etching MEMS devices and then creating out of things out of it. On dry etching, the process is simple. We, we use ionized gases. The ions would react the target material. In this case, I'm putting this thin blue, which is silicon wafer or any wafer for that matter. And when those ions are created, those ions would react with that wafer that needs to be etched. But for them to travel, we apply electro, we use electrodes, top and bottom, and we apply electric field. So that electric field will result into that plasma striking to the surface of the, of the blue wafer, which is shown as blue. It's not blue, it's, yeah, I've shown you that. And once that bombardment happens, those bombardment of these ions would result into removing material from the surface. But these ions would be selective in their direction between silicon and the mass material. So this would be where those ions bombard and remove that material. So it's kind of a, a it's called sputtering, which so is etching by removing material from the surface, not, uh, not reaction here, right? So there are different recipes. I'm showing silicon recipes here. So the left side is showing different combinations of different gases that come together. So each one is a recipe. This one is a recipe. So this is a recipe. So the, these different chemicals, their conditions of their pressure, the conditions of their uh, the, for plasma, what kind of energy at what frequency has to be applied. Once we do that, then it tells, tells us on the right side that single crystal silicon would etch at what rate. This is single crystal silicon, this polysilicon, this silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, aluminum, and photoresist. So for all these different materials, each recipe has a different etch rate. So now if I have, uh, I don't know, if I have polysilicon and single crystalline silicon, I have silicon dioxide. So depending on whatever situation is there in this machine, we would set that flow of gas, we would set that power like first one says 450 watt, 13.56 megahertz, this much vacuum, 2.8 tor, the gap has to be this much. So we get that recipe in place and then we know that what kind of etching we would get out of it. So this is an example of different recipes for etching silicon. Now in this case, we have just talked about silicon dioxide. They can be silicon nitride. There can be a bunch of different materials that can be there. So that would then be depending on the process engineer to be our choice of using one than the other. Now wet etching is now instead of using plasma, we are dipping things in chemical. So most often we can etch silicon dioxide, silicon or silicon nitride. So this is where we would dip things into solution and then those, those reactants would etch away the material that we want to remove. So now in a dry etch, a resist would stay, the feature would be formed and we would etch screen. But if you use wet etching, the wet etching will be going everywhere. So it's going to etch below the resist or below that masking material as well. So just a couple of examples. Phosphoric, acetic nitric phosphoric acid mixture can etch silica, can etch aluminum. And if you didn't know, we, we have always known that gold is a noble element. It cannot be etched, but there is this way of etching that also. So 
but this is a very, very reactive uh, combination of solutions that we use to etch gold, right? All right, so a few recipes for wet etch. Here we are talking about using this chemical called KOH, potassium hydroxide. And we know we are, it also says 34 weight by percent in water. So you have 34 grams of KOH and you have uh, how much? 60, 66 gram of water. You mix it, that's the chemical, that's the reactant. And use it at, uh, in this case, it's, it's just recipe 70.9 degrees centigrade. So you can have different etch of silicon in different orientations. So this is example of wet etch, an isotropic wet etch, which would etch differently in different planes. And here are the H rate K1 for silicon. All right, so 